Um, you might not know this from looking at me, but I'm a runner, uh, not professional. Um, and if you don't know runners, I should tell you that the one thing runners love more than running, it's talking about running. <laughs> so tonight I'm going to talk about running. <laughs> I'm one of those people that runs marathons for fun. Uh, I pay money to travel to and stay in other cities for the sole purpose of running races there. I cringe when people refer to my sport as jogging. <laughs> and uh, the shoes on my feet, just so we're clear, they're running shoes, they're not sneakers. I love running, and the very ritual of running and all the little bits that make it up, the passing wave to a fellow runner, that awkward stop at an ill-timed intersection where you're like stretching and running in place, and I, I laugh when I see other people do it, so you can laugh too when you do it. Um, or the signs that we make to passing motorists, those friendly gestures, you know when the cars come a little close? They all make up part of this amazing ritual that for runners is addictive as heroin and is necessary as oxygen. Um, the beauty of running is, for me anyway, that running is life. And life without running, it's, it's pretty problematic. Um, even when you can't run for a short, short time, if you've ever been around an injured runner, oh my god, they're insufferable. I've been that guy, you know, in all their talk of tweaks, sprains, strains, tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, oh, it goes on and on and on, it's insufferable. The reason why runners have so many injuries is because they run through their injuries. <laughs> They make minor injuries, major injuries, and major injuries a problem for everyone around them. Um, so you can imagine, if you can't run for a long time, what it does to some, someone. So not, if you think not running is bad, imagine being told that you can't run by someone else. That is the absolute worst. So let's recap. What do runners love? Talking about running. What do runners hate? Not being able to run. But what do runners hate the most? Being told by someone else that they can't run. Your mom could show up. I don't think you should run. You could visit an award-winning sports medicine doctor. Well, if you keep running, it's going to tear. Steve Prefontaine, he's a famous runner. He could show up, well, his ghost can show up, and tell you, I don't think you should run. And the response is still going to be the same. I'm going to run. So you can imagine how I felt in the fall of 2011 when a doctor told me I should focus 2012 on getting cancer free and not run the Boston Marathon. I mean, not run the Boston Marathon? That's crazy. Seriously. The Boston Marathon is the holy grail for runners. You have to run another marathon, marathon and run a qualifying time in that race in order to get to the Boston Marathon. This doctor was definitely not a runner. <laughs> now might be a good time to back up a little bit. So in March of 2011, after a rather rambunctious evening out on the town, I woke up, crawled to the shower, turned on the water, and proceeded to cough up blood everywhere. Now, it was enough blood for me to say, huh, that's weird. <laughs> but it wasn't enough blood for me to call a doctor. You know why? Because runners are crazy. So, Spring became summer, summer became fall, there were a few more coughing up blood episodes. And I finally mentioned it in passing to my doctor during a physical, to which she responded, what? <laughs> Two weeks later, I found myself being shot into a giant cylinder while being injected with a solution that makes you feel like you're wetting your pants. It's called a CT scan for co with contrast in the biz. I finished the procedure. I was quite relieved to discover I had not, in fact, wet my pants. 
And I made my way to work on that rainy, cold Friday afternoon, taking a long and circuitous route. When I arrived for, at work a few hours later, I looked down at my phone and there were five missed calls from my doctor and one very panicked voicemail message. Pierce, you need to call me right away and you need to clear your afternoon. Well, apparently the CT scan had uncovered a mass in my chest and she had made a, an appointment for me to visit a pulmonary specialist later that afternoon. So I made my way to the doctor's office and as I sat there in the examining room, waiting for the doctor to enter, my mind raced with all the possibilities. This was my first like big boy medical experience and I, I didn't know quite what to expect. But before I could reach any conclusions, the doctor entered and before he introduced himself, he looked me up and down. He said, Huh, you don't strike me as the cancer type. I know, right? Who says that? <laughs> but you know what? Looks can be deceiving. And two weeks later, I found out I was diagnosed with something called leiomyosarcoma, which is an extremely rare cancer to begin with, which when it's found, is found in the uterine lining of older women. Certainly not in the chest of middle-aged marathon runners. Subsequent tests revealed that the cancer had not, in fact, spread. But it was lodged in a rather precarious position in my lung, and the only real solution was surgery. So I made arrangements to meet with a surgeon. You will definitely lose part of your lung, I was told. And I said, well, you know, I don't know if that's going to work for me. <laughs> I'm a marathon runner, and I've qualified for the Boston Marathon, the holy grail of marathons, and it's going to be rather difficult to do that with missing lung parts. He said, uh, well, you might lose the entire lung. I knew this guy wasn't going to get anywhere near my lung. And I was fine, honestly, up until that point. It was like I was in a bad Lifetime movie, you know? And we finally reached the part where everything turns to slow motion. And the trickly piano music plays, and I sit down in an alley with the rain falling. That was when I met my oncologist for the first time. He was a rather jovial man, and he seemed very excited that we lived in the same neighborhood. And he really kept asking me when we could go out for beers, which I thought was forward. But in any event, he said, he goes, well, here's what I'm thinking. The surgery, when you have it, you know, that's going to be probably November around Thanksgiving. It's pretty serious stuff, and you're going to need a long time to recover. So you know, we'll probably meet back up in January, middle of January, maybe early February, and that's when the radiation is going to start. Uh, whoa, I said, radiation? What are you talking about? I'm having surgery to get the tumor that hasn't spread anywhere else in my body out of my lung. And I may lose a lung, but why would I need radiation? Well, Pierce, you might need radiation just to mop up any other cancer cells that may be floating around your system. Those are exact words, mop up. <laughs> I, I'm guessing he got his medical degree from the A&P or something like that. <laughs> I said, listen, buddy, this is not going to work for me. It's going to be hard enough running the Boston Marathon with half a lung. But January and February, that's prime time training. And if I'm doing radiation, it's really going to curtail my running to prep for the Boston Marathon. And that's when he said those words, Pierce, there'll be other marathons. You just need to focus 2012 on getting cancer free. I got up, I walked out, and I immediately called Sloan Kettering in New York for a second opinion. Now, if anything, a second opinion was going to buy me some extra time, and maybe I could just do second opinions up to and pass the Boston Marathon, and then I deal with it later. Or honestly, the, boss, uh, the second opinion was going to validate what I had already been told, or 
by chance, maybe there was a mistake. And when you know it, there was a mistake. I had been misdiagnosed. I didn't have Lyomyer sarcoma. I had the equally rare one in a million glomus tumor, which is also a soft muscle tissue tumor, and you can look it up on the YouTube, it's super disgusting, because it's typically found underneath the fingernails, not in the lungs. I had surgery, and was it tough? Yeah, it was really, really tough. But my surgeon, he was awesome, and he had a daughter who was a marathon runner. So he knew how important my lungs were to me. And when I woke up from surgery with my mom by my side, I found out not only was the tumor removed, but both my lungs were still intact. And radiation? I didn't need radiation. I was released on Thanksgiving 2011. I went back for a checkup two weeks later. And I asked my surgeon, when can I start running again? I had pretty much been running the whole time. It just took a break right for the surgery. He said, we didn't operate on your legs. You can start running whenever you want. <laughs> So run I did, and in April 2012, I made my way to Hopkinton, and I ran the Boston Marathon. 